All right, so they're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What is this? Got a new cup? <laughs> I thought it might be the Blessed Hope Cup. Wow. Is that a sneak peek for the anniversary? Huh? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just take a sip then. <laughs> I'll show the, uh, I don't know if the, if the online listeners can see that. It's a mug it's of our church name, isn't it? <laughs> it says, even so, we also should walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. All right. Yeah, because that verse is about baptism, right? And there's the water there. So if someone needs to get baptized, we can start sprinkling. <laughs> oh, I've got some on the Bible. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The title for the sermon tonight is Ye Are the Body of Christ. And so uh, I was just thinking about what is the last topic that I want to cover here on the midweek service. And it is just to remind you that you are ye. What's ye in the King James Bible? It's you, you being plural, right? The, the thou, the these and the thous in the King James Bible is speaking you in the singular sense. You know, most other languages, I think every other language has a you for singular and, and a you for plural. Like in Spanish, uh, tu is... Uh, uh, you singular, tu, and uh, usted would be you plural. I think most languages have some form of that. And so when the King James translators translated it, they used the these and the thous for the singular. Okay. Now, does it use a singular or does it use a plural when it speaks of the you? Ye, 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 that's plural. And so, you know, sometimes when we think about a church, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this necessarily, but you don't want to get, uh, t- you know, too sidetracked on this idea that when you think of a church, maybe you think of New Life Baptist Church, the thought there is, well, that's Pastor Kevin's church. Well, that would be a very singular you, wouldn't it? That would be a thee or thou. It says here, ye, so it's plural. Hey, for all of us, all of us, we are all the body of Christ. And of course, the body of Christ is the church. And for us, it is referring to New Life Baptist Church. You know, without you, we do not have this church. This church isn't built on on Pastor Kevin or Pastor Kevin and his family. All of us make up that body of Christ and we need to remember that. You know, when I have conversations with people, you know, maybe different pastors, different friends, you know, I might mention this church out there or that church out there. And I might not know that church necessarily, but I'll say something like, oh, who's the pastor of that church? And once again, you identify a church with the pastor. And yes, you know, uh, many times the way the pastor is, you know, the way he, he, uh, his behavior is, his character, you know, usually his fingerprints are over the, uh, sort of on the church. And so I get that idea. I get the idea that you sort of recognize a church because of the pastor, but that's not how we really ought to think about church. Okay. If you are a, a regular attendee, you know, if you're someone that says, you know what, I am a member of this church. You know, if, if you and your heart have set New Life Baptist Church as your, your, as your, your key church, your main church, you know, uh, then you really you are the body of Christ. You know, you are part of New Life Baptist Church. And we need to remind ourselves of this because I don't want you thinking while I'm away that somehow we've lost our identity somehow. No, you know, the church is not one man. The church is not one family. The church is everybody that makes up that body. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, For as the body is one and hath many members. Let's think about that a minute. Many members. So again, a a plurality there, right? Uh, Many people. And this is in all the members of that one body. So if if you're here right now, if you're sitting right here, you are all the members of that one body. If you're listening online, you know, this is normally a regular church, but you can't be out here tonight. You know, you make up that one body. Again, being many, there it is again, many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been, made, uh, have been all made to drink into one Spirit, for the body is not one member, there it is again, but many, all right? And so you are important to the functioning of this local body. You know, I don't want you to take the mindset as I go down to Sydney that, you know, somehow we've lost our identity or, you know, somehow, you know, uh, you know 
potentially thinking that you know, things aren't going to continue as they are. My hope, my desire, my prayer for New Life Baptist Church is that it will go stronger. You know, you, it will go from strength to strength. You don't always need the pastor around. And that's a great thing to have your pastor there. It's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You know, it, it's good to have your pastor there, but the pastor doesn't make up the entire church. We being many make up that one body. Okay, and so if we're losing one member, hey, it's not one member, but many. We're all here. You know, it's your responsibility to ensure that this church continues, that it goes from strength to strength, that you continue attending, that you don't take the attitude, well, pastor's not here, I don't think he'll turn up this Sunday. You know, I'm not going to turn up this week. You know, you should be there because you make up this body. And, you know, it, and I, I say this because I, I don't want you to have this, you know, this, this misconception because I, I kind of expect, you know, we're, we're a big family. We're 13 people, right? So if we're missing, especially for the midweek service, and we're missing for the Sundays, the church is going to feel a lot less. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like basically a quarter of the church will be missing, right? But you know what Jesus says in Matthew 18, 20? I'll just read it to you. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What an amazing thing. So you know what? If you turn out, and I, don't, I hope this doesn't happen, but if we turn up one day for a midweek service, right, and it's just three of you, you know, it's, if it's just two of you, but you've come together, you know, two or three of you come together for Jesus Christ to serve Him, to worship Him, to make up that body of Christ, He's going to be there in the midst of you. And so I don't want you to have this idea that maybe, you know, we'll, we'll look like less people. Maybe you will start feeling a little discouraged. Hey, why isn't everybody, you know, in church? Well, it seems like people are dropping off. Just remind yourself, hey, if we've got two or three here, Christ is here with us. Jesus Christ has taken up a seat. We're in his house and he, he's deserving of worship. He's deserving of honor. Hey, you're an important part to this church. Okay? Maybe you don't do as much as somebody else. Maybe you consider yourself as one of the least. And we're going to look at that later on as we keep going through this chapter. But you are an important part. You make up this one body. Okay, you make up this one body. Please set it in your hearts. New Life Baptist Church is my church. Don't think of New Life Baptist Church as Pastor Kevin and his family. No, you should say to yourself, this is my church. You know, when someone says, hey, what church do you go to? You know, hey, be, be proud. You know, proud, proud, pride is a sin. Hey, you know, be, be, uh, be, be, be excited to promote your church. Say, hey, this is my church. I love my church. The preaching is great. You know, uh, you know uh, worshiping God is great. Hey, how about you come and visit my church? You know, don't take the attitude or come and visit Pastor Kevin's church. No, it's, it ought to be my church, you know. It ought to be something that you have set in your heart. This is where I belong. This is the body that I'm part of. And uh, look at verse number 15 now. It says, If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand... I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the, is it therefore not of the body? Listen, what, some of us are feet in this church. Some of us are hands in this church, okay? Now, let's say you're a hand, okay? Would you look at, at, at a foot and say, well, I, I'm not a foot, therefore I'm not of the body because I'm different from the foot? What we're about to read here, brethren, is just a reminder that we're all different. We're all different. Some are feet, some are hands. Let's keep going. Verse number 16. And if the ear shall say, some of us are ears, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Okay? So we have different body parts here. A foot, the hands, the ears, the eyes, and the smelling, the nose. You know, and of course, we need all of this. These are all our senses. These are, you know, the foot allows us to walk. Our hands allow us to work and function. We all play a different role in this body of Christ. And it compares us to that body, okay? Just because the eye is not like the ear, it doesn't mean the eye is not part of the body. It doesn't mean the ear is not part of the body. And you know, sometimes in churches, people feel like they're kind of left out. They're a bit of the black sheep, maybe, you know? Yeah, but, you know, we don't all have to be the same. I, I don't want everybody to be the same. Otherwise, it's kind of like this cultish idea that we all got to dress the same, we all got to speak the same, we all have to act the same, and if someone steps out of line, you know, there's something wrong with that person, get him out of church or whatever, right? That's how cults operate. But no, that's not how a local body should be. You know, recognize that we're all different. We're all different, all right? Don't expect someone to be just like you when it comes to how you serve in this local body. 
And what I like about verse number 17, it says, if the whole body were the eye, where were the hearing? So we definitely don't want everybody to be the same. I mean, what's better? You know, if you've got a body, you know, a normal human body, you've got two eyes. Hey, two eyes are good. But what if we had 10 eyes and no arms and legs, <laughs> right? 10 eyes and, and no torso and no kneecaps. Then what's the point of having 10 eyes? You might say 10 eyes are better than two, but only if it's got a body that it can get plugged into, right? It can't work on its own. Hey, you might be a mouthpiece. You might be a preacher coming to preach. That's great. You know, we've got a lot of men that can actually get behind the pulpit and preaching. But if we're all preachers, then we're not going to get anything accomplished. You know, we need everybody working together, recognizing that we're all different. We all play a different role in this body and just get to work. You know, just, just support one another. You know, how would it be if you woke up one day and your arm said, you know what, I'm having a day off today and your, your arm drops off. You're not going to function very well for the day, right? You know, if you make a decision when, when it's time for church, you say, you know, I'm just not going to be at church today. I just, Pastor Kevin's not there this Sunday. I'm just not going to turn up. You could be a leg and the body's not going to be able to function without you. It needs you. Okay, you might just have one leg and then the church is just going to hobble, right? It, it needs a crutch or something. If you were there, you know, you, we could do so much more. Let's keep going. Verse number uh, 18. But now have God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it have pleased him. I love verse number 18. I love verse number 18, okay? It says here that God has set the members, every one of them in the body. You know, if you consider yourself a member of New Life Baptist Church, God set you here. He's put you here. You know, you thought it was your choice. You thought, I decided to go to New Life Baptist Church. No, actually, God picked you up wherever you were and placed you in this church. Amen. God said, I need you. You're an eye. You're a mouth. You're a nose. You're a spine or whatever it is, right? And he's put you. I need you there in New Life Baptist Church. So what this is telling us is that you're important to this church. God has set you there. Not only did he set you there, it says in verse number 18, as it hath pleased him. It pleased God to pick you up from wherever you were and put you in this church. And it says, look, they need brother so-and-so. New Life Baptist Church needs sister so-and-so. That includes the children. That includes everybody, you know, that makes up this body. God put you here and it pleased him. You know, so if you have this attitude of, well, you know, I'll just come when I feel like it. You know, I mean, do you think that's going to please God when he's put you there? When it pleases him to have you in church? No, he wants you in, in church. It pleases him. Okay, remind yourself when, when you find it a little bit difficult to get to church one day, just remind yourself, well, if I get to church, if I'm with the body, it's going to please God. That's going to encourage you to get out of, you know, out of your, your tired state or whatever you're feeling right there and, and to be in the local body. Look at verse number 19. Oh, by the way, before I read verse number 19. So if God has set us as members of this local church, and he's telling you we're all part, we're all members of one body. Then don't you need to then realize, well, God's put me here for a reason. There's a reason why he put me here. It's not like some random choice by God to put you in this church. You've, so you've got a reason to be here. And you've got to ask yourself the question. And, you know, these, these things, you know, you, you have to work out. Why did God put me in this body? What function do I serve in this body? You know, am I, am I, am I a hand? You know, am I a foot? You know, am I, a, am I hips? You know, what am I? You know, what part do I play? If God's put you here, you've got to figure what that is, you know? And one advantage, potentially, I think, one advantage of me being away and the family being away is even though I'm trying my best to work out what needs to be sorted out and who's going to be in charge of what, I guarantee you there are going to be things we miss. You know, I guarantee you when we get to church, you're going to notice, hey, that, that, that thing's not done, whatever it is. You know, someone hasn't done this or someone hasn't done that. You know, and then you can be like, why hasn't anyone done that? That's going to be your first response. And then you'll be like, hold on, why don't I do that? That should be the next response, right? Why do I have to wait for somebody else to do that? Hey, maybe that's the part that I've got to play. Maybe that's why God put me here uh, to serve in that capacity, whatever that capacity is. All right. It doesn't matter what role it is. You don't have to be like everybody else. We all have different body parts. You are something unique in this church. You are someone important. So I expect as we go through the weeks and the months, there are going to be things that I forgot to hand over or forgot to give, put someone in charge of. Well, you know what? Take it upon yourself. 
You know, you know, contact me, Pastor Kevin. I realize such and such is not getting done. Do you mind if I take charge of that? You know, I want to be in control of that. Praise God. You figured out where you fit then. You figured out what it is that God's put you in this church for. So I do see an advantage in that area, that there are certain things that are going to be picked up, and I hope you just make that decision. That'll be my job. That'll be my responsibility as I serve this local body. Verse number 19. It says, And if they were all one member... Again, if you're all just eyes or just all of us are just hands, uh, it says, where were the body? So you don't need a body if you're all one part. Like, where, where's the body gone, right? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Okay? Now are many members, but one body. And so, you know, uh, you know church ought not to be, a, a, you know, a, a, you know just, just like a boys club. You know, church ought not to be this place where, you know, it's just me and my buddies, you know, us for and no more, because we're similar, we're alike, we like one another, we get along, we have similar interests, you know. But if you're all the same, where's the body, right? We need everybody to function differently. We need people to, that are different. You know, there are things that I would never think about that others think about in this church. There are things that you will never think about that others are thinking about that can help this local body in, in the church. And so we need to understand that we are many, we are many members, but we are one body. And if we're one body, we ought to pray for one another. We ought to love one another. We ought to support one another. We ought to encourage one another. You know, how bad would it be if you're that person that discourages someone from church and they leave the church because you were the one that caused them to be discouraged? We, if that's you, you cause them to be that way, we lose a precious member to the, of the local body. There's something that person could have done that, you know, they were uniquely put there by God to do that job and you drove them out. As I said, you know, we wake up one morning, a part of your body's missing, you're not going to be able to do much, right? You're not going to be able to function very well. Could you imagine if you just lost, I, I think I told you guys a story once, that I lost temporarily my sense of taste. All right, I was looking for mouthwash. I was a kid. I was looking for mouthwash. I found some Dettol antiseptic and I just thought, well, I'll use this. All right, I, I, <laughs> I used that. And I uh, spat it out. Well, I think for the, over the next two months, I couldn't taste anything. It, it, must, it must have just killed my tongue, killed, killed all the taste buds, right? And I didn't want to tell my parents. I didn't want to get in trouble. And I didn't want them to get worried about it. <laughs> now, kids, you better tell your parents if you did something like that. But, you know, obviously, I can't. But, you know, it was kind of, uh, my mum would make spaghetti, my, my favorite meal, and I just couldn't taste it. You know, I, I, I'd eat it. I, I know it, it filled me up, but I just, you know, I, I couldn't appreciate it. And all I lost was the sense of taste. You know, it made my life a little challenging over the next uh, few months. And uh, eventually I got it back, praise God for that. But, uh, you know, just losing one function of your body really sets you back. <clears throat> what am I up to, brethren? Which, which verse? Number 21. It says, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So the Bible's telling us not to have an elitist mentality. You know, oh, these people are more important than these people. Oh, the church pastor, he's more important than this child in church. That's not true. We need each other. We need each other to function, okay? You, ca you cannot say to one part of your body, I don't need you, okay? So let's keep going, verse number 22. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. Hey, even parts of your body that seem feeble, that don't seem very important, they're necessary. You know, sometimes people need to go uh, and get surgery done and remove some type of organ. What, what organs can you remove that you'll still live with? People can remove like kidneys. What else? Gallbladder, spleen, append. Oh, man, you can remove quite a few things. In fact, you can remove your whole arm if you wanted to. You still live, right? But even, you know, sometimes people need to do that, for, you know, to, to prolong their life or, or give them better quality of life. But in the long run, there's going to be uh, other consequences without that organ, without that piece that functions in their body, right? And so we, we cannot uh, look at what might be more feeble or not look so good or we might look at little children and say, well, what part do they play in the church? You know, we, we can't take that approach. But, you know, we, we must honor one another. Look at verse number 23. And those members of the body, that's the ones that are most feeble, it says, which we think to be less honorable, okay, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, 
and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Okay, so in verse number 22, it says more feeble. Verse number 23, it says less honorable. These are people that may feel they're less important to the church. As I said, you know, these might be the children. These might be uh, people that have just recently joined the church. These might be babes in Christ recently saved. They may feel about themselves that they're more feeble, okay? But the Bible's telling us that they are necessary, okay? And, and, and look, we ought to bestow, and so what did it say in verse number 23? Uh, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. So who should get the most honor in a local body? The person that you consider the most important person? No, the people that you would consider to be the least. Okay, do you see that? Now the idea here, when it talks about your comeliness, comeliness means your beauty or something like that. The idea, you know, that I, I kind of think about here, where, where you give more attention or more honor or more care to that part of your body. You know, let's say, you know, a, a woman's getting herself ready for her wedding day or something, right? And she's trying to make herself look beautiful, but she wakes up that morning and there's a zit on her nose. Okay, there's, there's a pimple on her nose. Well, isn't she going to spend more time trying to cover that bit up, okay? She's going to give more time to that to make sure that, you know, uh, w whatever kind of defects she finds, she wants to try to cover that. She'll be given that more attention, okay? Well, it's not saying that people that are more, you know, uh, maybe considered lesser in the church, that they're, that are, there's something like that, but the idea is there, that that person needs more honor. That person needs more encouragement, Okay? So it, it's good to encourage your pastor. It's good to encourage the, the men that get up and, and maybe are more visible, the song leaders and those that read the Bible verses, those that get up to pray, those that get up to preach. But really, hey, you know what? The, one, the person that needs the most honor is the guy that picks up the rubbish at the end of the day and throws it in the bin. You know, the, the one that, you, that wouldn't be out there known by everybody. Maybe behind the scenes they're doing things and you don't even know about it. They're the people that deserve the most honor. Okay? They're the people that you ought to encourage the most. They're the people that you ought to take care of the most. You know, and uh, I, I think about, um, I've, I've used this example before, but, you know, in, in my old workplace, I've, I've told you I had a lot of staff under me, a lot, you know. And I, I would come in to work a little bit earlier, I'd say 10, 15 minutes early, just to go and greet every staff member. Okay? So I've got a position, you know, manager, this and that, whatever. Right? And then I've got supervisors under me. And then under those supervisors, I have, you know, just workers. And some of those are entry-level workers as well. Right? You've got these people. And, and, and in the eyes of, of the world, you know, they would look at, at, the, at the supervisor and go, well, that person's a little bit more important. They would look at the manager, well, that person's even more important. But it was important for me to make sure that I would go to every person that, that worked for me and, and welcome them. Every morning I would go and say, hey, good morning. Hey, how's it going? If they were busy, I'd just give them a wave if I saw them a bit busy. Uh, but if I realized they had a little time, I'd just have a quick chat with them, ask them how they're going, you know, and, and try to encourage them at work. And I, I'd be questioned by other people, why are you doing this? Why do you get there every morning saying hello to all your staff? I tell you why, because those that you consider to be most feeble are necessary. You know, if, in, if it's not for everybody pulling their weight at work that day, the work's not going to get done. All right, that, uh, you need everybody. The reason you employ those people is because you need each one of them to do the job you know, if, if, if some of them fail, it's going to let down the whole team. You need to keep encouraging those that are working under you. It didn't matter, you know, who had the title. Everybody was working hard. Everybody was accomplishing the job. Well, if that's true for a workplace, how true is that then for the house of God, for the body of Christ? That we need everybody encouraged. We need everybody functioning. Everybody needs to understand that they're loved, that they're appreciated, that they're important. Yes, even the little children that might not be able to do so much, we ought to, they ought to know that they are loved and appreciated by the adults in the church, rather than, oh, they're, they're a loud nuisance. No, they, they're great. They're going to serve us one day. They, they're going to grow up, and they're going to be the preachers, they're going to be the song leaders, they're going to be cleaning up, they're going to be doing a lot of the work, right? And, and they're going to be serving this local body, but only if we encourage them, only if we tell them their importance, that Jesus loves them, hey, that they need to serve in the church rather than think of them as some nuisance. Okay? Everybody is important. I'll just uh, read to you. You know, in, in the workplace, you might say, well, you know, they've got to work. Because if they don't work, they'll lose their jobs. Right? <laughs> they've got to work because they've got to get paid. And, you know, one of the sad things about the local church is people have that idea, they have that mentality of, well, pastors getting paid, 
or maybe some deacon's getting paid. I'm not getting paid to serve. Why should I be the one? Why should I clean up the church? You know, why should I wipe down the toilets? You know, you might have that idea. What, what am I going to get out of it? You know, you t- take the approach. And look, these things go through them. You might say that that's never crossed my mind, Pastor Kevin. Praise God for you. Okay. But I, I'm telling you the truth. It, it crosses the minds of people in churches, maybe even in this church. Who, wh- why should I do these things? Other people should be doing that. Okay. But here's the thing. You are going to get paid. You are going to get rewarded. All right. It's just not, it's not going to be in your bank account necessarily, but you're going to be rewarded in heaven. I'll just read a passage to you in Matthew 10, 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. You know how my goal is to get up here every Wednesday to preach for you guys? That's my goal. You know, I've had a few people say to me, hey, you can stay at my place. Praise God. Awesome. You know what? You, you, if you do that and I stay there, you're going to get a prophet's reward. You're going to get rewarded for that. You know, and then it says, uh, what else? He that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. We can share in the rewards of others. Those that are being righteous, doing righteous works, those that are preaching God's word, we can share in the same reward as them if we're hospitable toward them. You say, well, hold on, Pastor Kevin. These are the important people. The prophets, the righteous man, he's done all this great work. Yeah, but look at verse number 42. And whoso, oh, I'll read it to you, so I'm reading it to you. And whosoever shall dr- uh, give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Hey, even loving the little children in this church, you will get rewarded for that. You will get paid in heaven. So think about that for a moment. Every, everything you do, brethren, you walk past one day, you see a piece of paper on the floor, you say, oh, I'm not going to pick that up. I bet you it was one of those kids. I was one of the Sepulveda kids. They, it's their job to pick it up. Well, you know what? If you just pick it up, chuck it in the bin, God's going to reward you. He's going to reward you in heaven for all the service you do. All right? I mean, why leave it in the hands of others when we can all share in the reward? All right? So have that, you know, yes, I understand in the workplace it can be a little different because you're getting paid here and now. But what's more important, getting paid here and now or getting paid in heaven? Getting paid in heaven. Treasures in heaven are vastly more important. You can lay up those treasures if you just make yourself a member of this church. You say, what can I do? You know, and, and give, your, your, give your best. You know, don't just start something and then give up after a few weeks. You know, give your best. You're serving the local body. You're important. God has placed you in this church. Praise God for each one of us. I'm very thankful that God has placed each one of you because by you being here, you've encouraged me in the Lord. You've encouraged me as a pastor. You know, you've encouraged me to keep going, even sometimes when I felt like, oh man, what am I doing? You know, but just knowing that you guys have an expectation, you want to be in the house of God, you want to be fed the word of God, it encourages me to do the best I can to serve you. Look at verse number 24. 1 Corinthians 12, 24. For... Our comely parts have no need. That's no need of honor. That's our beautiful parts. But God have tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Verse number 25 again, that there should be no schism. What's the, what's the word schism? It's division. There should be no schism. There ought to be no division in the body. You know, one of the worst things that can happen in a church is when you create cliques. You know, I only talk to this group of people. I don't talk to them. That's really bad because that's the beginning of the divisions. You know, uh, the, the Corinthian church, that's what happened to them. You know, they had cliques. They had people, I listen to this preacher. I'm of that preacher. I'm of this. And you create these groups and you create divisions and problems. That's not how God wants his body to be, the church. Okay? No schism. But then what I love about that verse as well it says in, at the end of verse number 25, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The same care. Now, I understand that there are some church members that we get along better than others, that you're going to you know, have more in common with somebody in the church. You might be, you know, you know, create, you know, have certain friends in the church. You probably will spend more, even more time with that person. But even though you, you create friendships and, and you get along with some people better than other people, the, the commandment here is to have the same care one for another. 
So if your friend needs help and, and he's suffering and he's going through some trials, yeah, you ought to love that person, you ought to care for that person, you ought to do what you can to help that person. But if there's someone else in the church that you don't necessarily get along with so much, you ought to have the same care for that person. If they're going through the same hardships, if, they, if they're having the same needs, you ought to give everybody equal share of your care, one for another. And not just say, well, these select few, they're the people I'm going to care about. You know, no, that's not the right approach. God wants us to have the same care one for another. Verse number 26. And, where, and whether one member suffer, then we can say they deserve to suffer. <laughs> ah, yeah, he's suffering. Bro, yeah, he really deserves to suffer, you know. Because I know what that person's been up to. I know what brother and so has been doing. Yeah, he deserves to suffer. <laughs> it's the hand of, you know, it's the hand of God's chastisement upon that person's life. Suffer! Yeah! Is that what it says in that verse? Nah, that's a bad version, isn't it? <laughs> what did it say? It said, uh, I'm, I'm losing my, my 26. Okay. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So church is an opportunity for you to feel empathy toward other people. You know, when someone's going through problems and hardships and suffering, hey, maybe even get out of church. You know, what, 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 what view do you have on that person? What do you think about that person that's, that's having difficulties? You know, oh, they deserve it. That's a bad place. That, you shouldn't be thinking like that. You ought to suffer. All the members ought to suffer together with that person. All right, I've used this analogy before where, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you tweak a nerve in your body, you know, it might be just like in one area, like a small little nerve in your body, but you can have pains all over your body just from that one nerve. I've, I've experienced that. I've had a lot of back pain and, and like just struggling to walk and I just, I, it's just one nerve that's been pinched, you know, because that's how the body works, right? If there's one part that's suffering, it's like the entire body suffers, you know, if, if one part of your body uh, is, uh, you know, maybe you've pulled a muscle or you've broken something, all the other body has to work extra hard to try to do what it normally does, right? It suffers along with that part that is suffering. And so when someone in, in church is suffering, brethren, what are we to do? We ought to suffer with that person. We ought to pray for that person. We ought to think about that person. Hey, maybe they are suffering because of God's chastisement. Maybe it is their fault. Could be. Does that mean we don't suffer with them? Hey, it could be the hand of God's chastisement. We just say, well, Lord, can you please help so-and-so? Can you help that person? Lord, can you lift that person up? Lord, how can you use me to be a friend? How can you use me to edify that person that is struggling? All right? We ought to suffer together. And then it says, oh, one member be honored. All the members rejoice with it. But what approach do some people take when somebody's been honored, someone's been uh, congratulated, someone's done well, and they've been recognized? Oh, what about me? What about my recognition? Where's my honor? I'm not going to honor with that person. Where's my honor? I should have had that. No. When someone gets recognized, someone's been honored, it says all the members rejoice with it. We're one body. You know, every piece of good news that happens to anybody in this church, we all ought to rejoice over it. We ought to get excited for that person. Okay, uh, brother, brother uh, Matthew got a job. Hey, he started working this week. Hey, we all ought to rejoice for him. I don't know if he's listening in right now, but if he's listening in, hey, praise God for you, brother. We've been praying for you to have a work. We ought to rejoice for him, right? That's how we ought to be all the time. Anytime we have good news from somebody, we all ought to give praise. You get someone saved, we all rejoice. You don't say, oh, I, didn't get, I haven't got anyone saved. Brother so-and-so just seems to get someone saved week after week. I've not seen someone saved for a whole month. Is that the attitude you should have? Maybe brother so and is lying about his salvations. No, that's, that's a wicked approach, right? Just rejoice. Be, be happy. You know, we're one body. We're one body. We're working together. You know, when we get to heaven, this church will announce, I don't even know what the numbers are. God keeps track of the numbers, right? These many people got saved because of New Life Baptist Church. Because of the whole church. The whole body. We all work together. We got those numbers together, you know, for the Lord. We're rejoicing together. Look at verse number 27. Well, that's how it ends. It says, that's where I started. Now ye are the, mem are the body of Christ and members in particular. Ye are the body of Christ. Now, 
that's a scary thought as well. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a hum- humbling thought that God calls us the body of Christ. That God the Father sent His Son 2,000 years ago to do the works of God. And now Jesus is at the right-hand side of the Father. And now we're the body. We're being left here to continue the work that Christ has left us to do. You know, Christ, who is in the midst of us, He is the one that powers this body. He is the one that is the foundation. He is the head of this body. Okay? But we're all part of that body with Christ. And we're here to do the work that the Father left the Son to do and then the Son has left His followers to do. Okay? We're here to continue the work that Jesus Christ has left us. So New Life Baptist Church, brethren, is important. Okay? It's as though Jesus was on the Sunshine Coast, you know, preaching the gospel, you know, helping people. That's our job, to continue the work that Jesus Christ has left us here on the Sunshine Coast. Now, please go to Matthew 25 for me. Go to Matthew 25. Because I know you guys have sins, and I have sins. Yeah, we all do. I know you have issues, and I've got issues. Uh, you know, I, I can't hide all my problems. Eventually, if you know me long enough, you're going to notice that I fail in certain areas. And, but I know, I've known you guys long enough. I know you guys fail in some areas, right? And so the thought might be, well, why should I serve with all my heart this local body? Right? Why? I mean, it's brother so it says, man, they're sinners. Right? I, look, they, they have issues. Should I really be the one that, that works hard to serve in this body when I'm just serving a whole bunch of sinners? And that's an attitude that you could have. But just remind yourself, it's the body of Christ. Remember, we're the body of Christ. Ye are the body. So if you're serving one another, who are you serving? You're serving the body of Christ. You're serving Christ. Matthew 25, verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered. These are the words of Jesus. I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I like the next bit. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Brethren, if Jesus walked in the doors right now, and he said, I thirst, what would you do? Wouldn't you be like, I'll get it, Jesus. <laughs> Let me get it. Right? Well, what if someone in this church says, I'm thirsty? Are you going to have that same attitude toward them? That's how we should be. Let's keep going. Verse number 36. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick. And ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done that unto one of the least of these my brethren, Ye have done it unto me. Unto me. How well should we serve one another? When you pick up a role in the jo- in church, whatever it is, how much of your heart should you put into it? You know, when you go and you get a, a, a cup of water for a child in the church, what kind of attitude should you have when you do that? You should say, hey, it's like I'm serving Jesus. Hey, there's a piece of paper on the floor. Hey, there's a rubbish there. One of the Sepulveda kids left it there again. I'm going to pick it up because Jesus left it there. And this is the house of Jesus, and he wants me to serve him. That's the attitude we ought to have. You know, when I get behind the pulpit to preach, I ought to be thinking Jesus is in the midst of us. I better preach a sermon that Jesus will be happy with, that gives him worship, that gives him honor, right? That he can say, well, Pastor Kevin, you've done well expanding my word. When you think about serving one another, it's because we're serving Christ even if it's somebody in the church that you may not like that much, that you may not get along all that much. Oh, just ignore that person. Well, you're ignoring Jesus. Is that what you want to do to Jesus? Or are you just going to go out of your way and say, well, I don't really get along so much, but I'm still going to say hello. I'm still going to give them a smile. I'm still going to shake their hand. I'm still going to welcome them. I'm still going to see if there's something I can do to help them or pray for them about, because that's what I would do to Jesus. 
right? We're serving Jesus Christ. Now, please go to uh, Hebrews. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Remember when Jesus says that if you took in a stranger, that it's like you took him in, right? He used that example. And the next thing that I want to bring to your attention, uh, especially while I'm gone, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think our church is really good at this, so, you know, please, you know, don't think when I say these things that I'm saying that, you know, we're a horrible church and we can, like, can we do better? We can always do better. I can do better as a pastor. We can all do better, okay? We can all do better. But one thing that I really want us to focus on, especially while I'm away, is our visitors, strangers. Are you going to take in the strangers? Are you going to welcome the strangers? Or is your attitude going to be, oh, that guy's walked in, red flags, he's a false prophet, he's probably not the same as us in his beliefs. What kind of attitude are you going to take with that person? Let me just read a few passages to you, and just for you to think about how important this is to God. Okay? So obviously when we look at the Old Testament, we look at uh, the, the church in the wilderness, which was Israel, right? And uh, God gave the law to Moses. The first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. And in Exodus 22, 21, it says, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. When you think of a stranger, think of someone that does not belong to that nation, right? That's a foreigner. That's a visitor. Someone walks in, we've never seen that person before. Okay? That's a stranger. Well, don't vex the stranger. Don't oppress him. Don't run the stranger off. Okay? For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. You know, before New Life Baptist Church, you were a stranger from this church. We were all strangers at some point. And if you've been at a good church, it's because that church has received you as a stranger. Okay? And you know what? The stranger, the visitor, eventually becomes a semi-regular, and hopefully one day those semi-regulars become a core member of the church. Every church has this. Every church has a group of people that make up the core group where if they're missing a service, you're kind of worried about them, right? <laughs> when they're missing, it's like they've got to be sick or they had a car accident, and you're kind of, hey, you're right, brother. You had that attitude, right? Then you've got your semi-regulars where they come sometimes, and sometimes well, when they, if they don't turn up, you're not too, you know, you sort of, well, it's usual because they don't always turn up, right? And then when they turn up, it's a blessing. And then you have the other group, which are your visitors, right? Which you don't expect to turn up. Well, that person, right? Jesus Christ says, look, take that person in. Be welcome into that person. Okay? They're a stranger. They may not even be saved. Take them in. Okay? Because it doesn't matter if they're not saved. They're going to be hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. They might get saved. Okay? And then that's what, Jesus, that's what God says in Exodus 22. Then in Exodus 23, verse 9, it says, Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So Jesus, God says this twice to them. Hey, don't forget the strangers. You were once a stranger. Okay? You were once that person that did not go to a church. You were once somebody that walked into a church for the first time and were uncomfortable. You don't know anybody. You know, you, you know you ought to be in church because that's what God wants, but I don't know these people. You come in, you're a bit uncomfortable. Maybe as soon as the service is done, you run out before anyone says hello. Hey, we were all that person at some point. So there are going to be other people that walk in like that, and you've got to understand they're going to be like that. Okay? And that's Exodus. Then in Leviticus, Leviticus 19.33, And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Listen, a visitor walks in, a stranger walks in, and they want to make this their church? Love them. Love them like anybody else in this church. Get to know the stranger. I know we have this thought, well, it's pastor's job to go and welcome that person. And it is the pastor's job. It is. You know, and so, oh, pastor's talking to him, therefore I won't go talk to them. Okay? And we, we kind of have this mindset, well, I know I should say hello to that person, oh, but they're with someone else, and I, now I don't have to say hello to them, right? Because it it's always a little bit awkward to meet people for the first time and to welcome people. Okay? But who ought to welcome the visitors, the sojourners, the strangers? 
Ye are the body. All of us. It's the responsibility of everybody. Listen, if a visitor walks in, all of us should desire to go and say hi to that person before they run out. To welcome that person before they run out. All of us. They're, they're your guests. Ye are the body. They're the strangers. They've walked in. Hey, they're your guests. When, when, when a visitor walks in, just say, this is my guest. They've come to my church. Hey, we are the body. Hey, maybe this person is somebody that God has placed in here to be a future important member of our church. Maybe they're not saved. Well, that's why they're here, to get saved, to hear the gospel from somebody that cares. Listen, God had to tell the Israelites in Exodus twice. He had to tell them in Leviticus. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible, terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow. Look at this. And loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Brethren, can you set that in your heart? When a stranger walks in, the visitor walks in, I'm going to love that person. I don't know what state they're in right now. Hey, they might even be a false prophet, but I don't know. They're a stranger. My first thought is, I'm just going to try to love that person. I'm going to show them that we're a loving church. We're going to show them that we want them here to hear the preaching of God's word. They might be so valuable to us in the future. I'm going to receive them. What did Jesus say? If you receive a stranger, you received him. Okay? You are the body of Christ. And uh, why is it so important for us to entertain strangers? Well, you're in Hebrews 13, verse number 2. It's because they could be angels. <laughs> Hebrews 13, verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Do you believe that, brethren? That we could have a visitor walk in, we may never see that person ever again. I don't know. I don't know how angels operate. And all this time, that person was an angel, looking like a normal human being. Ah, someone will say hello to that person. Man, it's coming from heaven. <laughs> it's come to check out the place. What is New Life Baptist Church like? How can I report back to God and say, hey, the, the work that they're doing, well, you know, they, yeah, they love souls. They're getting out their soul, uh, uh, a soul winning. Uh, they're, they're singing praises. They're preaching great sermons. But God, they never say hello to me. They never welcomed me. Man, how embarrassing that would be, right? To have a church like that. We don't want to be that way. Remember, ye, ye are the body. They're your guests when strangers walk in. Please go to Malachi now. Malachi chapter 3, the last book in the Old Testament. We end on this one. Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. When a stranger walks in, just remind yourself, what was I like when I walked into church for the first time? I was nervous. I couldn't wait to get out of there before someone said hi, whatever, right? People feel that way, and it's our job to welcome them, to say, hey, hey, we love you. We love you being here. I hope you can get something out of church. Hey, are you coming back next week? Right? Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. And so God is telling Israel in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, hey, welcome the stranger. Why does God have to repeat this so many times? Well, you know, when God has to repeat something so many times, it's because the natural man does not want to do it. This is something that's easy to, to let go of. This is something easy to ignore and to drop and say, well, that's not so important in my church. Because in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 5, now, I've gone through the books of Malachi. Uh, I think it was during the pandemic. So was it during church? I can't remember. I've, I've preached for this, and I was showing you how, you know, the, the, story, the, the events of Malachi take place maybe about 100 years after the Jews came back from Babylon, rebuilt Jerusalem, you know, the temple, etc. Things started well, but then a few generations down the track, they've gone back to their old ways. And God is once again angry at these Jews. You know, they're, they're not living out what they're supposed to live out. And then God promises that John the Baptist will come, promises that Jesus Christ will be coming back and, and settle things, all right? So, but look at verse number 5, Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. It says, And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. These are people, these are the Jews. And against the adulterers, so they're doing wicked sins. And against false swearers. And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. 
the widow and the fatherless, and look at this, and that turn aside the stranger from his rights, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. We have a list of sins that Israel got back into, the Jews got back themselves back into. And one of those sins was they no longer wanted to entertain strangers. You know, that they were, they were not considering the visitors, they weren't considering the strangers that would come onto the land, that they're not, they're not loving the strangers how they ought to. And God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon you guys for the sins you've committed. You know, mixing all that with sorceries and what else? False swearing, adultery. You know, it's, it's a wicked sin to not love the strangers. Can we do better with our visitors? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we doing a good job? I believe so. But can we do better? Yeah, we can. You know, I, I don't preach this to discourage you. I just want you to wake up and just realize, hey, I am the body. I belong to this body of Christ. This, is, this, this house, you know, God's put me in here. And when the stranger walks in, that's my guest. Hey, that stranger might be an angel. Hey, that stranger might be someone that God is setting into this house for future purposes, and I've got to make sure I welcome them in, that I don't run them away, chase them away. It takes time for people to learn and to grow, you know. Praise, praise God for the... I, I love this church. You know, we're, we're so good on doctrine. We're so sound. I know, like, I know if I preach something so wrong that you guys are just going to come and flood me with questions. <laughs> like, I'm really encouraged by this church. We have a lot of good things going for us, right? But I just want you to remember, pastor's going to be away. Family, the, his family's going to be away. I don't know if I'm the best at welcoming strangers and visitors. I try my best. Sometimes, I, you know, they get out before I even can say hello. But I'm hoping if I don't get to say hello, I'm hoping somebody caught them on the way out. You know, I'm hoping somebody stepped in and did that. I'm hoping somebody's checking to see if that person's even saved, Right? And if they're saved, hey, they're a brother in the Lord, how much more should we love that person, you know? If they're a brother in Christ, if they're saved, we ought to love our visitors. We ought to love our strangers. And so I know I focus a lot on that last bit, but I really want you to think about that because I really want this church to continue to grow while I'm gone. It's hard for churches to grow while the pastor's not there. You know, even down in Sydney at Blessed Up Baptist Church, there are people that want to be part of that church, that they want to be there, but I, I get calls, I get emails, but it's like, but, you know, when is there going to be a pastor in place? And so people delay coming if there's no pastor around, all right? And so we might see something similar while I'm gone and people aren't seeing me necessarily on Sundays, that there might be a drop in our attendance. I hope not because you're important, okay? You're important, okay? Uh, or there might be visitors that walk in and, well, oh, there's no pastor, I'm going to leave. No, you welcome them. You make them feel that they're an important part of the church, Okay? Welcome the strangers. And so I wanted to finish up there, brethren. Ye are the body of Christ. It doesn't say the pastors are the body, but we all are members of that one body. That one body is the body of Jesus Christ. We serve one another, brethren. We're serving God. We welcome as strangers. We could be welcoming angels. We don't know. We don't know. So whatever visitors come in, hey, give, give your best. You know, serve them as though it was Jesus Christ himself that walked into this church. Okay, let's pray.